On the surface, rail fanning in Wilmington, North Carolina is nearly impossible. A city that was once ACL headquarters now only receives one regularly scheduled freight train, which unfortunately moves under the cover of night. Add to that the fact that the local short line operates almost entirely on private property, and an area rail fan like myself may feel up the creek without a paddle. But like I said, that's how it appears on the surface. While living in Wilmington for school and now work, I've been privy to a lot of neat action on the high iron and have even developed a new hobby. Let's start with CSX. The Class 1 has their Davis Yard on the west side of the Cape Fear River, which spits out three branch lines to the east, one to the south, and the Wilmington subdivision to the west. All traffic in and out of Davis is served by a pair of locals to and from Rocky Mount, symboled L607 on the outbound run and L225 on the inbound. The freight is then split up in Davis, with the majority of it moving east across the Cape Fear and into Wilmington, bound for the state port. This is train L613, the port city's nighttime regular. The local very rarely runs in daylight, but there's an exception to every rule. I was eating breakfast with some friends one winter morning when a horn was heard, and I'm sure you can imagine what the next couple hours of my life looked like. I quickly finished my food and made way for the state port, where it appeared as if the outbound port job was underway. My day had just gotten a lot better. A couple blocks up the road and I had the tripod down as I watched what I believe to be one of two daylight port jobs in a three year span crawl towards me. Wilmington is a relatively small city, but thankfully for me, the track layout doesn't make it seem as such. The way the bird flies, it's only about four and a half miles from the port to Davis Yard, although it takes CSX nearly 11 miles of trackage to achieve the journey. Add to that the eight mile an hour speed limit inside the city, and I was able to beat the train a mere two miles up the line. The tracks cut through a neat little neighborhood here on Forest Hills Drive, a location I'd had in the back of my mind for some time. Now, if you're like me, you've probably never heard of ICL. The Independent Container Line Group is a small but extremely reliable shipping line calling on three European ports, Chester, Pennsylvania, and Wilmington, North Carolina. ICL ships berth at Wilmington every Friday morning without fail, which means Saturdays see large outbound cuts of red stacks on the head end of the port job. These boxes leave Wilmington bound for Charlotte and Chicago, but that's not to say they're the only customer on today's train. Following the 42 ICLs was a set of seven Zims, rounding out the total to 49 containers, a pretty good sized train for as small a port as Wilmington is.
had one more spot in mind before I bid farewell to the Daylight 613, and it appears as if I wasn't the only one looking for the train here at King Street. I'm not so sure as to the rationale behind walking towards a moving train, not to mention this would have been a really neat head-on shot had it been unencumbered. Thankfully, the pedestrian had safely made way by the time the CSX Jeevos were close. Now I know Jeevos are monotonous, but something about the steerable trucks, loud horns, and general build to an ES44AH really has my heart, and a set of two looks even better. It was a pretty good looking train all around, especially with those bright red ICLs gleaming in the winter sun. The port transfer is just about the only class 1 train I can think of where shipping containers and manifest freight ride alongside each other, and is pretty neat to see in this day and age of precision scheduled railroading. While a majority of the manifest traffic is just like any other mixed freight, this set of Colombo Energy hoppers stick together. Operated by Inviva, they run in between Greenwood, South Carolina, Hamlet, North Carolina, and Wilmington, carrying export wood chips for energy use in Europe. A lot of these factoids really don't matter to a rail fan in the grand scheme of things, but one of the things I love about the hobby is figuring out the logistical effort that goes into train movements. The size of a train doesn't necessarily dictate the effort gone into working it, however, as exemplified by Wilmington's hometown short line, the Wilmington Terminal Railway. The short line was founded in 1986 and acquired by Genesee in Wyoming in 2005, exclusively serving the port of Wilmington and its surrounding customers. The railroad rosters a fleet of end cab switchers, all of which are dressed in their parent company's corporate orange. Number 1203 recently kicked the bucket, but was a fun sight to see in its bumblebee scheme. engine's black and yellow look is awfully similar to the old Bethlehem Steel Corporations, and was a nice refresher from the ever-intrusive G&W Orange.
WTRY is decently difficult to see in action as nearly all of their 17 track miles are on port property. Sometimes you just stumble upon a train, however, as was the case when a pair of SW1500s were taking the evening switch job back to the port. The short line ventures into public view right around lunch and dinner time, when they're not busy acting as middleman for CSX and the state port. These interchanges can be anywhere from 20 to 80 cars, always making for an interesting day for the G&W team. Some trains in the area are much more predictable, such as this little CSX local as seen through the trees after class one day. Aside from the port transfer, CSX runs an eastbound switcher out of Davis, serving whichever customers have called upon the train. The crew makes it into town about once a week in order to serve two lumber customers, seen again at King Street towing two empty center beams back to the yard. I mentioned that Davis Yard shoots three branch lines out the east end, only one of which has been covered so far. There's really not too much special about the other two, but I did happen upon some action in Castle Hayne one afternoon. What looked to be an abandoned industrial site at the very end of the line somehow managed to produce a train, led by GP38-3 number 2049. In addition to this mysterious assortment of facilities, Castle Hayne is home to a sizable Martin Marietta loadout. The Rock Company has their own remote-controlled GP7U on site to perform shifting, and I was able to observe shortly after finding that curious local. Rock Company has not one but two loadouts in the greater Wilmington area, with the other sitting on the west side of Davis Yard in Leland. Leland is also home to another neat little critter, Chattahoochee Locomotive Works GP10 number 5117. 
The engine has been a personal landmark for the last six years, as I drive right on by when entering or exiting Wilmington. Martin Marietta receives unit rock trains into Davis Yard, which are then split up and delivered to the two loadouts accordingly. I caught the bobtail of that delivery one day, with a set of light GEs returning to Davis Yard. Yet again, I was pretty pleased with the heavy Jeevo up front. This branch extending into Leland is what's known as the Malmo Spur, coming out of the south side of Davis Yard. It may look like just another branch line, but the Malmo Spur is home to one of the most unique operations I've had the pleasure of witnessing. And no, I'm not talking about a set of light Jeevos. I'm talking about the United States Army. 18 miles south of Leland, in Southport, sits the Military Ocean Terminal Sunny Point, or Matsu. Sunny Point receives somewhat regular shipments via rail, which get interchanged with CSX at a secure location just south of the Malmo Spur. Interchange traffic also includes cars for civilian customers on the south side of Sunny Point, which all folds into the Army making round trips to and from Leland. I believe this to be one of a very select few locations in the country where United States Army locomotives can be seen from public property. Sunny Point is an extremely strategic location for the United States military, having shipped out some 80-odd percent of ammunition used overseas since the Vietnam War. That being said, even their train crews are on high alert, preceded at all times by a security detail in a high rail truck. On this date, the Army was bringing in 88 loaded containers behind some mixed freight, and I had set out in hopes of finding the train. I got lucky south of Leland, although packed up immediately after the engines passed for fear of looking suspicious.
Wilmington isn't just a land-to-sea location for the military. The local airport is used extensively by government aircraft performing touch-and-goes. I've heard a varying range of reasons as to why this is. Some say Wilmington's runway is long enough to accommodate most aircraft and close enough to DC for training runs to make sense, while others have said that we are a, quote, doomsday airport should the nation's capital be under attack. I like to believe the former. Regardless of the reason, the government has treated me to all sorts of neat planes over the years, including two different Air Force Twos, one being a 737 and the other a 757. I'd even carry my camera to class with me should I see something neat overhead, and it paid off one day when the Coast Guard sent in a beautiful C-130. This beast is used for long-range search and rescue missions, and has been under government ownership since the 1980s. I no longer need to stroll around campus with my camcorder because in the spring of 2022, I graduated from UNCW and took a job with North Carolina Ports at, you guessed it, the Port of Wilmington. Although I've been busy enough to stay away from chasing trains too much, I have been provided with some great opportunities and enjoyed every minute of it. Working with the trucks, ships, and most importantly trains has been just great so far, especially when Wilmington is consistently setting industry standard KPIs. But of course, you can't have a port without the iconic cargo ships, which I've developed quite a liking towards. Perhaps one of the coolest ships I've seen is the O.N.E. Hawk sailing up the Cape Fear River, destination Wilmington. These ships are just absolutely amazing to see in action, effortlessly bringing thousands of containers right up to American soil. ONE is the direct result of a large merger in the steamship industry, with NYK Logistics, K-Line, and MOL joining forces in 2017 to create the Ocean Network Express. Headquartered in Tokyo and Singapore, ONE vessels, containers, and other equipment are painted in an attractive magenta and white scheme. This is twofold symbolism, representing the network's desire to stand out within the quote drab industry, as well as pay homage to the colors of the famous Japanese sakura tree. The ONE Hawk is a Panamanian flagged vessel of the NYK Bird class with a container capacity of 14,026 TEU. At the time of filming, the ship was assigned to ONE's East Coast 2 service, calling on three Chinese ports, Pusan, South Korea, Cartagena, Colombia, as well as New York, Norfolk, Wilmington, Charleston, and Savannah. The Port of Wilmington provides a neat opportunity to see vessels like this underway, as ships must sail 26 miles up the Cape Fear River in order to make port. The river lets out in Southport, uncoincidentally home to the aforementioned Sunny Point Terminal. Knowing that the Hawk was scheduled for arrival, I brought my camera and tripod with me to work one day, and timed my lunch break around its approach. There's a nice little public dock at a place called River Lights, where myself and some other enthusiasts had gathered to watch.
In contrast to how railroad companies operate mostly independently and in competition with one another, steamship lines have formed alliances in order to broaden their reach and enjoy quicker turnaround times. ONE is part of THEA, or Transport High Efficiency Alliance, which also includes Haypag Lloyd, Hyundai Merchant Marine, and Yang Ming. All four of these lines help provide the Port of Wilmington the EC2 service, with boats calling roughly once every week. The ONE Hawk is one of 204 container ships owned by the network, and was one of three assigned to the EC2 service, with the others being the ONE Falcon and ONE Wren, all of which belong to the NYK Bird class. Alliances rotate vessels in and out of services depending on cargo demands, dry dock schedules, and a slew of other variables, with Thea's EC2 service currently carried predominantly by Haypag Lloyd and Hyundai vessels. No hobbies will compare to railroading for me, but these container ships are a sight to behold. Towering above the treetops and stretching a hundred feet longer than the Eiffel Tower is high, the ship's passage at River Lights definitely sparked a new interest for me, and I'm already looking forward to watching the next one float by. While it's a small city here in Wilmington and doesn't appear to offer much to the transportation buff, there certainly is a lot to see if you know where and when to look. Thanks for rail fanning, sky watching, and ship spotting with me today. I hope you enjoyed this look at the port city's many forms of industry as much as I did.